Welcome to week one of the on-demand learning. This is the big one. This is where we are going to talk to the different marketing frameworks, theories and ideas that will underpin the whole semester's worth of practice. So instead of trickle feeding out a bunch of ideas, well, we're just going to drop all of them on you right now. So. This is the last time you're going to see the semester run schedule at the front of the lectures. After this, it's going to be straight in. Now, the way the course is broken up, we have three functional segments and it's delivered across two halves. The first functional segment is the first two weeks, first three weeks. We're going to talk about strategy. We're going to talk about consumer behavior, as in what a consumer does with the internet and how you are going to self-analyze yourself. We have the marketing mix in its online glory as three weeks worth of operational applied content. And second half of the season, we will be looking at applications. We'll be looking at the frameworks that we lay down here. So things that when we talk about the different types of product and when we talk about different types of pricing strategy, and when we talk about different elements of promotion, these will be case studied through marketing applications. So the theoretical frameworks, the stuff we're going to explain to you at the front end, we're going to apply on the second shift. So if you're feeling like, oh, I can just cut past this stuff, I can fast forward, uh, best of luck. But if you are on familiar territory, don't feel that you have to go again, feel that you can go, yeah, I know that, excellent, I'll be using those ideas. Wonderful, I've got a grounding to work with. And what we're gonna do with this session is we're gonna talk about some of the foundational ideas that are going to interact with the whole of your semester. And that is also, you are going to have the opportunity to apply these ideas theories, concepts and frameworks we're about to explain, you're going to get to apply them in practice, not only during your project, but to your experience of this subject. Welcome aboard, it's very applied territory. So, first thing we want to do about do here is we want to talk a quick bit of marketing history, uh, but also internet history. For functional purposes, the internet kicks off around 1994. Now there's a huge thing back to the 60s, there's various arguments about when it really becomes the internet and none of that matters. What matters is that in the mid 1990s, the first wave of internet access became commercially available and publicly available. Your host, starts here at 1993, where I first used a very terrible piece of technology, the uh, very slow modem we had it in the office, and we called it the coffee heater because you could put a mug of co cold coffee on the modem and it would reheat the coffee. The technology ran so badly and so hot. And that was 1993. In 94, I had an email address. Uh, I was running a student union newspaper at a university and we had an email address so people could send us uh, letters to the editor via email. Most of the students on campus didn't have email addresses. Uh, most of the engineering students did, but we had it and that's where it kicks off for me. I had the opportunity in the very early days to go this looks interesting, I want to be part of it. Now historically, over the way the web has been classified and evolved, you'll see there's a concept of Web 2.0. When we started, we didn't call it Web 1.0. When Web 2.0 emerged, everyone went, oh, all right, here's a line. Everything from that backwards is Web 1.0. So the idea of the version one of the internet is static websites, non-dynamic interaction, and a lot of separation of functionality. Your chat client, uh, internet relay chat, 
was a standalone piece of software that you ran off your desktop computer, which didn't integrate into your web browser. Your email had its own dedicated client, whether it was Outlook, Thunderbird, whatever it was. That, again, separate application. So you didn't have multiple tabs open in a web browser. You had multiple software packages running if you wanted to do different things. Uh, things like ICQ, um, MSN Messenger, all these tools were dedicated separate functions. Then Web 2.0 comes about, and this is matched by both an increase in processor power of computers, so servers could do more, and increase bandwidth capacity, so we could have more traffic flowing, and a greater desire by major corporations to establish uh, monopoly strangleholds over the open, wild, multiple terrain of the internet. So the Web 2.0 starts around your social media platform. The idea that our communications and our websites were together. So instead of being static pages that we just updated now and then, the dynamic content. Now we had things like forums, we had things like the, uh, the Waffle Forum existed in the wild as a web forum, but they were not an integral part. So there wasn't when Facebook came about in the first instance, its revolution was to take real-time chat from the Messenger clients, blogging from WordPress and Blogger, static pages, and merge the whole thing together in a way that enabled you to make connections with friends and family and see just how racist the uncle is who keeps posting those long out of date, much discredited memes. But that was Web 2.0. Recently, a bunch of people have tried to go and say that there is a Web 3.0. And Web 3.0 basically is shorthand for the grift economy. I'm going to say up front that Bitcoin is a gambling uh, package and the blockchain has had no useful functionality that couldn't be done by your own Excel file saved on a hard drive. And the non-fungible tokens, the NFTs, were one of the most amazingly beautiful grifts I've ever seen in my little con artist life. So we're not going to do, not taking sponsorships from gambling corporations, and we're not talking about uh, shell games, money laundering, and general grift. So most of Web3 is going to be missing in action. Equally, though, Metaverse is a new attempt by Facebook to own the Web 4.0. It, this is the problem we're facing with the internet, by the way, is instead of it being driven by valuable and value and co-creation, people finding uses for things, uh, Metaverse is being driven because two companies have gone, well, I'd like to dominate everything, thank you and they're currently feuding with each other. So the day that Apple decides to buy out Facebook or vice versa, yeah, it's all gonna be messy. But basically the metaverse is the attempt to bring the 3D rendered universe that didn't work in Web.1 because there wasn't enough bandwidth, didn't work in Web.2 because there wasn't enough interest, hasn't worked in Web.3 because people still get violently ill from using VR headsets for an extended period of time because it messes with your inner ear. Uh, they're trying to bring that back for version four. And if it works, look, I'm gonna say this up front. If it works, it will be great, but we do have to solve the biological function that to access the metaverse, we require a headset that has biofeedback problems and has had biofeedback problems since it was first conceptualized in 1996. It's been a long time of trying and if we can get it right, more power to us. But at the moment, we're going to stick to some more core frameworks that have lasted a little more test of time. So the things that we want to give you the heads up about, as far as the internet goes for e-marketing, 
Social media is a key function and social media here is basically people as product. So there's a little bit of services marketing straight up there. The purpose of social media is to connect people to people, irrespective of what they're trying to do with chatbots and the metaverse. Being able to reach out to an audience and have an audience reach out to you is the feature set. The problem is sometimes you can have, well, not just sometimes, depending on who you are as a user of social media, you may find an audience that you have no interest in whatsoever reaching out to you because they don't want you to be on their platform. There are pros, there are cons, and they, social media is not yet a mature product. Uh, that's the other thing we should probably highlight is the product life cycle is very important when we start thinking about how young the technology is. 1994 was the first point where we could draw a line and say the internet is a thing for the general public. It's 2022. The internet turns 30 in a couple of years. We don't have a mature product that is the internet yet. We are still, we're in the growth phase. Maybe we're going to hit maturity eventually, but we are not a stable product yet. The second thing, search-based marketing. Google is getting progressively worse, which is a shame because at its outset, Google was really good. There were multiple search engines, they did different things and finding things on the internet that were true and accurate was a lot easier. The problem is it's a lot easier to make content for robots than it is to make content for humans and robots read faster and are less discerning than humans. So we're running into some search based problems, but we'll talk about that and we'll gauge that. Now I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about search engine optimization and SEO as feature because it's too unstable as a medium and particularly the general idea is that there is a cold war between the two operatives. Us as people who want our stuff found by the search engine and the search engine who doesn't want their search code manipulated by those damn dirty apes who are out there creating content to manipulate a search engine. So if somebody comes up and says, ah, oh, I've, I've cracked the secret to the SEO 20 minutes later, the Google engineer is worth half their salary will find by their automated searches looking for people bragging about breaking the search engine they will find it they'll update the patch and the 49.95 you just spent on a PDF has been wasted functionally though search engines work on the principle of giving content that their users want to their users so basic principles of make things people want to access is more important than trying to manipulate an unknowable Excel spreadsheet somewhere in San Diego. Third element, bandwidth first solutions. This is one of the things about the evolution of the internet is we have gone from the dominance of text because text is very low bandwidth and very quick to be able to be transmitted across the internet to we have a lot more bandwidth. We have a lot more capacity to move high resolution files. As usual, content expands to fill networks. So we don't need 6K resolution streaming. We don't really need 4K. I've recorded all these in HD at 1080 and it's a little better than what I need. We don't have to have the mo we don't need 4K streaming. We don't need 4K 120 frames per second streaming. But because we can, it's out there and it exists. So video is gaining in dominance because it's easier to transmit. Used to be that you needed a TV aerial and, or, and a TV transmitter and a whole lot of infrastructure to broadcast. Now you just need a computer, a camera and a YouTube account. But because bandwidth first solutions means that we're also seeing a lot of heavy traffic, things that are starting to create digital divides between those who have the bandwidth and those who don't. 
and augmented reality and virtual reality will be very heavy on their bandwidth usage because there's going to be a lot of calculative upstream traffic as the VR headset tries to work out what it needs to know and the AR headset works out what it needs to know and where it is to know it and a lot of downstream high resolution will be expensive to work with. The next thing about the current internet that we're going to deal with is that we're going to look at the applications as platform. Uh, now this is where the purpose of a platform is its priority as to how you want to use it. So the mindset here is that Facebook can be used for hundreds of different purposes. For you, your task is going to say, what's the thing I want it to do for my project? What is, so every app platform, every application is what do I want it to do? So functionality is the core thing you're looking for. It also is that a lot of things that used to be standalone independent objects have become merged. So, um, a lot of things are being moved into subscription-based, application-based, platform-based, in the cloud, on the web, through the browser, in order to create business models that have ongoing cash flow rather than create the best possible solution for the consumer. Of which this brings us down to the final thing is that everything about the internet is currently uncertain because a lot of the golden, the you know, high value golden children of the internet are burning through their cash reserves. Uber was going to revolutionize everything because an application, when well, it turns out that their whole business model was not the application, their business model was wipe out their competitors by undercutting their pricing until they ran out of capital. And, uh, but the problem was, it was supposed to be until the competitors ran out of capital. Uber's running low on capital and we will hasn't burnt out and hasn't destroyed the thing so that they become the natural monopoly. Facebook is probably the closest at the moment, but even they are starting to have the problem of, well, what is it that they do that people want to continue putting money into? And this is one of the big things, is that all of these uncertain futures are dependent on a couple of things. The Web 5, so post metaverse might just be we actually pay subscriptions for services for things that are on the internet that we go hmm twitter that's a that's a semi decent thing i'll pay my 2.99 a month uh, so the product bundling pricing all those sorts of considerations at the moment a lot of these platforms that are getting older so things that were founded in the mid 2000s are having They've got some revenue streams, they've got some income streams, but the questions are so slowly starting to be asked of, is this enough? And eventually some of the big ticket players are going to fall over and go broke because that's what happens. Now, if during the course of the semester, a platform you are using goes to the wall, well, I expected at least a couple of them to, so that's okay, we'll just fix it and discuss what happened and work out what to do next. Now, let's talk some marketing theory. And I'm not gonna teach you intro to marketing in a single slice, but I am gonna to talk to you about some of the mission critical elements that are going to influence the way I'm going to get you to engage with the internet across the course of this subject and across the course of your four assessment tasks and one live real time real world project. It's going to be fun. I'm looking forward to it. So first thing you've got to understand, definition of marketing. We are running with the AMA definition as our go-to, as our touchstone. What's different about the way it works this time is that I don't need you to recite the definition. I need you to apply the definition. So as we go through the semester, you are going to be engaged in the activity of marketing you are going to run a project and it's a marketing project. The set of institutions, well, that's going to be us, the course, and you, the product owner, the product champion, 
the social media manager. That is you running your own project. You are those institutions. And we are going to explore the processes. So when we get to the Marketing Mix lectures, it is about the procedural elements. What can you do with pricing? How can you use distribution? What is it that product lets you do? And understanding product theory lets you engage with and say, hey, I want to make, I want to make a product and value co-creation is going to show me how. So it's all about doing. And to that end, the critical component that we want to also flag on the way past is the Chartered Institute of Management has a definition. And that is marketing is the management process responsible for identifying, anticipating, satisfying customer requirements profitably. This is your overarching mantra. Identify, anticipate, satisfy. Identify, anticipate, satisfy. And to do that through a procedural element of create, communicate, deliver, exchange. Make it explain, make it, make it available, explain to people why they want to consume it, get their consumption, get that trade-off, get that value back. So we're moving from this as a theoretical conceptual framework into a thing you've got to do. And I say this now as someone who is currently the owner of a number of projects, this course included, but also I run my own YouTube channel. And occasionally I will, and I run my own, I've got you know, an Instagram account, a Tumblr account, a YouTube account, multiple YouTube accounts, uh, a couple of websites. I do this stuff as well as tell you about it. I go out there and do it with varying degrees of enthusiasm and experimental design because my value that I want to do is I want to test the waters. I want to try things out. So as a lead user, I can come back to my peers and say, hey, here's these ideas. Give them a go, see if they work for you. So I don't need the massive success because I'm in the innovator camp. I'm in the 2.5% who can take the hit of expense and failure. So I can communicate that back to the early adopters who are the opinion leaders. And I can say, hey, here's a bunch of, here's a half a dozen cool things. Go do stuff with them. And the opinion leaders get the credit and the glory and they go off and convince the world. So that's my role. I create content, and this is part of what I'm doing. I create content. The communication, I'm explaining to you why the marketing theory is useful. Delivery, welcome to accessing this across whichever platform you accessed it through. But also the exchange. I create this so that you do things in my course that make my course more interesting for me and for my fellow members of the course and for the other your friends peers and colleagues who are the other students in this course and ultimately in the full exchange cycle full disclosure i teach you stuff about marketing so that when i get to mark those assignments they are interesting i want you to learn so that i get to mark cool things and i get to be involved in awesome stuff so that is my motivation, that is my exchange, this content for your doing of cool things. So there's a couple of theories we are gonna to talk to. And again, what I want to explain before we go into the theory recap is the purpose of a theory. Over the course of this semester, I'm going to use a number, a number of times I'm gonna tell you refer to theory. Marketing, doesn't necessarily use name theory. We don't have something like uh, the Newton, Newton's law. Uh, software has more laws than marketing does. Whereas in marketing, we have more theories. And our theory is a way of explaining the world that we think applies in multiple instances. To recap that, anyone can explain how the world works in hindsight. The trick of a good theory is that it is a way to explain how the world could work 
in foresight. And that if you follow that theory and you apply the ideas of that theory, it improves your percentage chance of success because our theory is here to explain how the world could take place. So theory is non-guaranteed, that's why it's theoretical. Uh, it is applied, it's something that you can use, but also it's a conceptual framework, it's a checklist. It may not be an equation, it may be an idea. And lastly, the purpose of all of this is to make it easier to do what we do. I ask you to use marketing theory, I ask you to read the marketing theory, I ask you to engage the literature because it makes life easier. My job is not to make your day worse. My job is to make our day, me as the marker, you as the assessment doer, to make our day better. Part of that is through giving you some ideas to say, build on this. Because if you were to go out and drive a car, I'd assume that you wouldn't start from a basis of going, well, I'm not going to learn how to drive. I'm just going to get in there. How hard can it be? So first set of theories, we're going to go borrow a little phrase here. Uh, we're going to go with something old or something new or something borrowed, something blue. You're going to be married to your theory by the end of this. So the first thing, a classic, the marketing mix. In this course, we're going to use the classic four Ps. Those of you doing services marketing parallel to the subject or have done services marketing, seven Ps of fair game. But my priority here is I want to use two types of marketing mix. I want to use the classic here. And we're going to step through them piece by piece. But the thing you need to understand is that you're going to be using the marketing mix. And these are your control panels. So as marketers, we create products. We set the prices for those products. We set the distribution channels. We work out where their place will be. And then we communicate those messages out to our desired audience to say, hey, here's a thing you want. It's over here. It's going to cost you this. So each week, we're going to get you to play around with one, of the, one or more of these elements. They are cross-wired. The marketing mix. It's not the marketing for single items. It's the marketing mix. So the mix itself gives you an opportunity that when I increase the cost of something to make it, I use, uh, it's more expensive for me to produce, so I set it to a higher price to recoup my costs and make a better profit. That changes the quality perception of the product, which means I've got, then got to change the way in which I promote it. And it's possible I price myself out of the particular distribution channel I'm using because it doesn't fit. If I'm targeting the dollar stores and I start becoming more expensive than a dollar, not going to work. So all these elements crosswired, interacting, and we're going to talk about crossover effects as they cascade down the line. But we'll start with the product in a couple of weeks. The big thing you need to really appreciate here is when you are running your live project, the marketing mix is your toolkit. It's what you can use to make your project work. So when I set out to create a short TV series, and this is my ambition for 2020, uh, 2022 was to say, I want to create a TV series and I want to make it accessible to my friends. And I chose YouTube as my distribution channel. I chose Facebook as my promotion mechanism. And I chose 10 to 15 minutes as my time price because I knew my mates. They weren't going to go, they weren't going to come around to my place on a Friday night to watch my show. But I could on a Monday evening when most of them had some degree of free time say, hey, I've got my 15 minute episode up, want to go have a look. And the product, well, my mates are not that dissimilar to me because we're mates, we've all got shared interests. So I created something that I would find enjoyable to watch and enjoyable to make. And that was my product done with the market segmentation tool. All those elements come together. It's accessible because it's YouTube and it's a product on YouTube and it's got timing 
prices. It's free because I'm never going to be able to sell. Hey, friends, give me 10 bucks for a YouTube production I made. But that's the point. The point is we use those tools and we use those tools to run our projects. Second thing I want to introduce you to is I want to introduce you to this idea of SIVA. Now, SIVA was uh, created by Devon Schultz. Uh, the late Schultz is, was one of the world's best researchers in communications and promotion. And they came forward with this idea of a marketing mix that was focused on the other side. So these aren't the elements that you control. So solution information, value and access. This combination broke down, it was an analytical tool that broke down the customer's reaction to how you were using your marketing. Solution is the idea of being, what does the product, what does the value offer do for the customer? Information is how do they know about it and what do they need to know about it in order to be able to access the solution. Value is what does it do for them in exchange for what they've had to expend to get it. And access is can they make the value come to life? Can they get the solution? Can they get access to it? Can they afford it? And can they get it to work? And Siva's a different way of viewing the world, but it's very close to the idea of co-creation. If you take this tool, it's not one where you can checklist it either and go, oh, I've provided a solution. It's like, what is your solution? Not, I've provided a solution. What is your solution? And then the cascade of, in order to get the solution, and I will say this, as someone who creates content, my solution is I like to create entertainment content. But what you need to know is sometimes you need to know some reasonably obscure pop culture references in order to get what I'm talking about. Which case, to unlock the value, uh, if you know it, you know it, and you're like, ah, I'm an insider. I know the thing he knows. And access. If you haven't watched some things from the 1990s, some stuff will make no sense to you. But that is by design as well, because I've got an audience who likes the 1990s. So the features of SIVA, the thing that, and a paper for SIVA will be up on the website to support this. It is customer facing. The customer, it is a review of what the customer is going to do or need to do to get to the value offer. It's not necessarily things under your control. You can't go, oh, I'll just uh, flick a few switches here and change the information. It's very much a review, but also it's a really great way to be able to run a marketing mix back. Be able to say, all right, price, product, promotion, place. I've made my changes there. What does that do on the SIVA side? So SIVA will show up in a few points and we're going to explore it as a tool. It is a mechanism for you to use to also evaluate your own conduct in your own projects. What is it you're creating? That is, what is the solution? in terms of the eyes of your audience. What do they need to know in order to be able to get to that solution? And what's that solution worth to them? And do they have the requisite skills, resources, and assets to be able to access all of the above? All right, there's something borrowed. If you're doing services marketing, I'm going to just point you to the theories. I'm going to say that these are useful theories. Uh, if you're not doing services marketing or you haven't done services marketing, Find someone in the course who has and have a chat to them. So the first thing you need to understand is that the internet is very much a service platform. Uh, it is the solution to a problem in services marketing and the problem of inventory. And one of the solutions to inventory is automation and the internet is automated in that sense of if you're not directly accessing a person, aka social media real-time responses, then you can do a whole series of service delivery through automation, through website, through application, through other means of stockpiling. On the other hand, though, the internet is a perfect example of intangibility. You can't serve a can of internet. Inseparable. 
you've got to be on the internet to consume the internet. The bandwidth you didn't use is bandwidth you can't bring forward. And it's inconsistent. And that's going to be a joy of this operation. But also it's a feature. Inconsistent means it can be massively highly customizable. Con side is the thing that worked on Tuesday may not work again because it only worked on that Tuesday at that time because you had all the algorithms aligned and gave you access to the 300 people you needed. So inconsistency is feature. The second theory we're going to borrow from services marketing is relationship marketing theory. And this also underpins a chunk of what we do in, and the way we do the course. So in relationship marketing, the Morgan and Hunt, uh, the Scandinavian school of relationship marketing, including Grunroos, as there was a huge falling out in the nineties over this, uh, Short version is, in America, Leonard Berry had a term, relationship marketing, that meant direct mail, databases, and catalogs. Over in Europe, the Grinroos and friends had the term, relationship marketing, that meant trust, commitment, reciprocity. The two combined in 2004, and things went horribly wrong for everybody, and it was a complete disaster, because the Americans went... Why is database marketing so important now? And the Europeans went, what is your problem with what? Why are you asking us for a thousand stamps? For us, the key, the definition of relationship marketing is it is trust, commitment and reciprocity. Trust is the, the ability to depend on the other party. You earn and gain that. And there's a whole bunch of different theories underpinning it. But basically for us as marketers, uh, we will need to trust the platforms that we are using that it will work. You upload your file and you hope your file will get distributed. Commitment is the fact we move from transactional. You've created an account, you've customized your account, you've put effort and energy into maintaining this account because you see it as more than just a one-shot transaction. And reciprocity, the value trade will average out in the end. And this is something in this course, is trust, commitment, and reciprocity underpins the way in which we engage. In no small part for the fact that you're going to bank 20 points early, 20 points across the hall, and 60 points within two weeks of each other. So there's a heavy back end where reciprocity, that trade of value, you're going to go get a lot of points back from me in a very short period of time, right at the end, after you've done a whole series of actions leading up to it. So the course is built on marketing foundations. Uh, familiarize yourself with the relationship marketing because it's useful. The other place we're going to borrow some frameworks is we're going to take the zone of tolerance model into out of services marketing and across to our own practice. Uh, there's two places I want to highlight this for. First is your own world, your life, your worldview. Uh, understanding how zone of tolerance works is really useful. Getting used to using it as a tool for yourself, for your own understanding, your own insight, uh, game changer. When I encountered this theory, suddenly my life went, hey, wait a second. I understood why if I'd built something up, if I'd hyped something up, I could be less pleased about it than if I was went in with no expectations. So I kind of toned down my expectations for what I thought would happen when I went into a movie cinema. And I got to see a lot better. I, I enjoyed movies a lot more because I wasn't expecting God-tier, life-changing, earth-shattering events. I was expecting 90 minutes of celluloid entertainment. Lowering my predicted expectation made it easier for me to either hit the zone of tolerance with the desired service, but also to not fall below the zone of tolerance. Similar things should take place across the course of your operation of the internet. I will ask you to set expectations for yourself. I'm going to ask you to set goals for yourself. I'm going to ask you to run projects. I'm going to tie this particular theory right back 
to something a little bit later in the course. And that something is, I will ask you to set expectations for yourself and then you will determine how successful you were. Equally, I'm going to ask you to use a software platform. So it's probably a good idea to get used to zone of tolerance before you start going deciding what it is you can achieve through your project. Uh, last thing to, on the zone of tolerance that's really important, experience drives perception, perception drives expectation, and the gap between the expectation and the perception is mission critical to understand. Also, I am well aware that this is the third offering of MKTG 203E2, so I've changed a bunch of things. Because the conditions, the environment, the circumstances under which this course runs will not be the same as the last two years. I cannot deliver the experience of the previous two years because I don't have the social infrastructure aka I don't have the lockdowns, that really made last two seasons just dynamic. So I've used the zone of tolerance already in the refit and recalibration of this course. You personally want to have a look at, give a zone of tolerance a bit of a look over, get some experience around understanding it, because you're going to be doing some appraisal of yourself, of the platform you've used, but also you really want to get good at this because it will help it'll help a lot just life generally all right the uh the new product development this is a change of conditions because i want to get you to think about how you're going to deal with the fact that you are now a content creator and you are constantly making new product and hear me out on this one at the core of what we do, this is a product. This video is a product. I am a product creator. I create course content. I create YouTube. I write things on Twitter. I write stuff on Tumblr. I make new products on a regular basis. So what we want to think about here is that this is, a, again, a conceptual jump. We want to become familiar and as a cohort, as myself included, because I'm creating new content. Thinking about new product development as something to live and breathe, as something to not set aside as a distinct, discrete and novel process, but to be able to go, all right, how's it work for what I do? And it applies to any offering that has value, because any offering a product is an offering that has value, so any offering that has value, all of these elements can contribute down into something as simple as writing a tweet. So there's a couple of things to consider here. Uh, we're going to talk about novelty and newness as well, and this is crossing a little bit into consumer behavior, where we'll pick it up again, a little bit into product theory, where we'll pick it up again. The internet is driven like it's a novelty machine. The ability to find new content is unparalleled. Equally, the ability to find old content is amazing. Novelty is important based on newness to audience. And I'd like to thank the Stranger Things TV series for introducing Kate Bush to a new generation. Because it's a perfect case study. Running up that hill, the Kate Bush song, that was part of my childhood, is now part of a childhood of a whole bunch of new generation. If you haven't been exposed to this song, then it's new to you. If it's the first time, he's like, wow, this, this artist is amazing, this song is incredible. Newness, novelty, it may be old to me, but it's new to the new audience, and therefore new to the firm, but also old to the firm is not the same as new to the world. So, the other consideration here is something that's new for us may not be new to the world. I have had this, uh, case in point is this subject. There's a bunch of things that we are going to do in e-marketing that are old school, old techniques, stuff you have seen that you personally have done before. But it might be new to me, 
and it's the first time I've put it into a course. That's new to Fern. It's not the same as new to World. So novelty is really important. It's your audience who determines whether something is new. And this is why you want to be using market segmentation, and we're going to go into that shortly, and why the Ansoft matrix, which is in week two, is really important. What is new is determined by the experience levels of your audience. Now, there are types of new product as well, and this is something that you're going to come to terms with. When you create a social media account for the first time, you are going to be creating content. And your content, which could be new to you, might be very familiar to your potential audience. So it could be better, different. There's only one you, so your take on the world is novel and unique. Or your take on the world is not novel and unique, and you are a New York Times writer, and your cold take has been seen a thousand times before. Therefore, your slight variant on the same idea is continuous. Really new products are very difficult to create, and I say this as someone who has researched innovation adoption theory and someone who's done a lot of work in trying to be innovative in teaching. It's really hard. On the other hand, quite new products. Very good at those. Uh, improved second generation, upgrades, variants. But that's more my style. And continuous. Better versions. This slide deck, this video, is a continuous innovation. It is version 3. I've changed the artwork. I've changed some of the content ordering. I've added in new ideas. And I'm re-recording it from last year. So I will speak the ideas in a different way. Welcome to also the framework that you're going to be living as you create content. A couple of things to consider. If you have a thematic assignment to your social media presence, then you're really wanting to focus down on continuous. You want to be providing not the same content as yesterday, but similar enough to keep the audience happy, new enough to keep the audience satisfied. I tend to stray towards quite new product in my social media platform because I quite often will react to something rather than reposting a piece of content. I will try, because it's my nature, to, if I add a caption or a comment or a remix or a rework, uh, continuous as well also allows you for things like a repost, a reblog, the use of old content. A remix would be a quite new product. A brand new song no one's heard before would be a really new product. Continuous is a cover. Quite new product is a remix. Really new product is an original song. And the ultra new product is an original song played on exploding guitars because no one's heard that before. And this is the second type of, by the way, this is the first type, type of new. Second type is innovation types. Continuous innovations. You have a product, you make it slightly better. There's an opportunity for you to do this, by the way, in throughout the course. Uh, all assessment tasks, sorry, no, the two assessment tasks that are the reports, the E, technology engagement analysis, and the E, technology project review, the ET and the ETPR, the ETAPER, have a resubmission option, which means you can do continuous improvement or dynamically continuous improvement on your assessment task. Dynamically continuous is where you've got to, well, something exists, but you've got to make it, it's been made that little bit better that you've actually got to retrain yourself. Uh, Office. Microsoft Office has updated a couple of times in 2022 with continuous improvements that made it more stable. And they've done a couple of dynamically con continuous things where it's popped up a little dialogue to explain what happens now because they're teaching you a new behavior. Uh, you doesn't work the way it did 20 minutes ago. Discontinuous is when it all goes to hell in a handbasket or it all gets completely new and you find yourself going, well, 
I wasn't expecting to edit video on a mobile phone, but here we are. So draws down from different areas. Again, discontinuous innovation is really hard to do, really hard to create. Even worse to research because you've got to find several of them and research them whilst they're still discontinuous and get to an audience that hasn't seen them before. Oh, it's, it's a nightmare, I tell you. All right, a couple other things to understand about innovation that's really important. Not everybody is innovative, and you, personally, are not innovative across every product category. Most of the market, nearly 60%, 70% of the market, is driven by something other than than wanting the newest, latest, and greatest. There's a big market for Me Too, for followership, for classics. There's a big market for opinion-led consuming. Opinion leaders create the need opinion followers. Opinion followers are incredibly valuable because they are an audience and you need that audience. So it's okay not to be innovative. In higher education, uh, innovation is just machine gunned at you week in, week out. You are encountering new concepts, new ideas, new frameworks, and you're having to integrate those into your existing understanding and work out how to use them. And it's okay if it all gets a bit much. Equally, it's okay to then know that, look, you might be so Me? I'm really big on teaching innovations. Love the area. But at the same time, there's a big demand for classic education structures. And there's also a big demand for me actually keeping one of my innovations running for more than 20 minutes and not getting distracted by the shiny and the new. 2.5% of the market's driven by the shiny and the new. But also, I might be absolutely driven by innovation in one field, but can you? get me to try a new thing when it comes to mobile phones? No, you can't. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not big on new tech in mobile. I'm not big on new tech in video games. I play, like I'm driven by innovation in music, but equally I've got a massive classic collection. So it's okay to have a spectrum. You don't have to define yourself by where you are on a Rogers innovation adoption curve. Speaking of Rogers, uh, one of the critical things, we're going to deal with this idea a few times, but once you get this embedded now, relative advantage is your new best friend. This concept out of the Rogers five factors is what does the new thing do slightly better than the old version? And this is how you get an innovation to be adopted. It's got to be slightly better. It's got to do something, create more value but it only has to be slight. It doesn't have to be massive. It's relative. It's got to be better than. And also defensively, how do you thwart a new product by showing it's slightly worse? So get yourself comfortable and familiar with the five factors. They are a very useful tool as well across uh, the whole of marketing conduct to be able to go, that's a new thing. How's it work for me? Where does it do? What does it fit? So it's a good theoretical framework uh, for you because you are going, if you are launching a new social media platform, platform new social media account during this uh, subject, it will be on a platform that has other social media accounts of a similar nature. You've got to be that relative advantage. You've got to embody it and deliver it. So that's the other thing to understand about the theories here is they're very practical. Be better than your opponent is a very practical but how do you be better? That's where we're going to put it into practice. All right, the innovation strategic choice, a couple of things here. I've mentioned this uh, before. I'm going to just cluster it together. It is a strategic decision. Something that's new to us. Also, it's okay to go chase new to stuff because, hey, I've never used this before. I've never done this sort of thing before. Uh, now, there are literally millions of YouTube episodes out there. And my little light comedy format has been done by thousands. But this is the first time I've done it, so it's new to me. And that's why I went after it, because it's new to me. 
didn't care, don't care, still won't care. I'm not doing this for an audience that is more than me and a select group of people around me. It's a niche target, it's novelty for us, and we're good to go. Alternatively, you can do something that's new to market, and this is where your Ransoft matrix kicks up. Do you have an existing market? We can make something new for them. Every day that you post to social media a piece of content that you have not posted before, you are providing something new to the market, but also something old to the market if you're on... Now, this is where it gets challenging. It's innovative enough, it's continuous innovation, it's good enough, it's new, it's content, it's like, oh, I've got to see a photo. Oh, I like that cat, I've got to see a new photo of that cat. That's good. That's relative advantage, that's just enough. The last thing, you the world, you could come up with something that no one's ever seen before. If you do, well, you've got to explain it to them. Uh, you're in discontent, you are new product, new audience, because if it's not existed before, you don't have an audience for it, and you don't have an audience who's seen it before, and you're in discontinuous innovation, and you are at diversity in your Ansoft matrix. Which is the final real hook thing. When we talk about interconnectivity of ideas, it's really important to realize that these ideas on screen are absolutely dependent on your Ansoft matrix square, on your market segmentation. Those tie together. So, in new product development, the quick checklist, these are the eight steps. You aren't going to get used to doing these in, like that, just, because you're going to be running a social media account. Ideation, how, what am I, what's today's content? Yeah, does it fit? Yep, yep, can make it work, okay. Generally online with what I'm trying to do with the overall project, should get me a good return. Make the content, put it up, how's it responding? Oh, good reactions, okay, should make more of these. Uh, repeat, rinse and repeat as required. We will take some time out in the course to work on some of the new product development steps because I think ideation, idea generation, it is something that I do, uh, again, for my own YouTube channel, I will sit down and say, all right, I've got, you know, I come up with an idea. I'll be wandering around doing something else and I have, well, I've got an idea. Quickly scribble it down. Then I'll come back and say, well, can I make 20 versions of this idea? Because I want it to be for, t <coughs> my season runs for 10 episodes. Uh, so I want it to run for two seasons. Can I make 20 versions of it? And if I can, then it goes ahead. So there's an ideation to idea screening. Concept development, marketing strategy. These are, strategy is going to underpin what you do and you will check for your alignment. Uh, if you are going out there to do content creation and your plan is to make a Twitter account for your cat, yeah, um, well, I'm hoping that you've taken plenty of photos of your cat, but also, uh, unless if a dog shows up and the, you know, if your pet dog shows up in half the photos, the cat's going to have to be running some commentary for it to be online with your strategy. So be intentional. Have your strategy guide what you're going to do. But also product development, we are going to do a number of exercises to help get those skills up, to help you with from idea to actual. To go, hmm, got a concept, now it exists as a thing on the internet. So the marketing strategy questions, uh, this is going to be a driver for you. Who's the content for? Who are you making this for? Because you can choose your strategic set, product and production orientation. Product orientation and production orientation are strategic orientations that you can use. You can just make it because you want to. Tumblr, the home of I'm going to write stuff and put it out into the write stuff, hit post, and write other stuff. And if it gets reblogged, it gets reblogged. Twitter, the home of well, I can respond to other people, I can create my own content. And Instagram, the home of filtration based lifestyle of what am I going to show the world? So who's it for? 
who is your audience? What do they you want from that audience? What are they going to do in response? How are you going to make it? And that's what your strategy is going to be about. We're going to talk a bit about budgets and pricing and how to do it. And also, what's long term? Now, again, I chose, I wanted to create a, I looked at the model that the BBC used for light entertainment and it was six episodes. So two seasons of a BBC classic drama was 12 episodes. They were 30 minutes in length. So my view was, if I can create 30 episodes, that is three 10 episode seasons, and those episodes are around 15 minutes each, I will have done more content than a BBC Light Entertainment show with a much smaller budget. But that's long term for me. Like that, that is the, I want n number of episodes, then I'm going to decide, do I want to do this for longer? Uh, final thing on the product development. We are going to get you to do, this goes from a theory. This goes from value co-creation, which we're going to talk about value, into here. Here's my idea, and now here's my idea here as a product. It goes from a thought to something. I mentioned an audience profile a couple of times. Uh, this is a thing also. Map yourself onto this framework. Find out where you are for the use of social media, but also where you are for concepts like marketing strategy and market segmentation and all the theories I've talked about. Are these familiar territories? Are these things, Do you, are you going, hey, I want to know more new ideas. Where do you sit in this framework? And how does it work for you and for the target audience? Because one of the things that's kind of useful here is that relative advantage. Late majority's relative advantage is that everyone else is doing the thing they don't want to be left out. Early majority's relative advantage is I want to copy the fashion leader. Early adopters' relative advantage is I want to be the fashion leader. And the innovator's early relative advantage is my god I've never seen this before, it's new. Those are four different motivations. And they are clashing motivations. The early adopter wants to differentiate themselves. The early majority wants to copy the differentiator and the late majority doesn't want to be left out. Three, this is why we have a constant cycle of things moving through fashion, is early adopters are going, ah, oh, gah, I've been copied by the early majority, must change, must change. And the early majority is like, please don't leave us. We want to copy you more. So look for it, find it, embrace it, become it. Let it map you and let you understand where do you sit? And again, critical thing to understand here is that you're not an innovator as a personality trait, it's a behavioral trait. And that behavior changes by product class, product category and market. Of which we should talk a bit about that. Segmentation, targeting, and positioning. Hello, friends. Segmentation, targeting, and positioning. This is the big one. You're going to do market segmentation. And I know that this is one of the areas as marketers in training and marketers in practice. As trainee marketers, your hardest task here is getting used to the idea that you have a viable target market you're not going to address because you can't split your focus. And you can't split your focus because you're not resourced up enough to do that. Hey, segmentation. Let's, all right, first thing you need to understand. Segmentation, targeting, positioning. Three steps in the process. A Segmentation strategy takes a wide range of varying consumers and tries to cluster them together in a way that makes sense to the marketer for the marketer to engage. So we're looking for people who are going to have a similar response. I have used segmentation to build this subject. I have gone, 
who is available on Monday who wants to do the course, who is available not on Monday who wants to do the course. That's, that's it. Two pathways. Live learning, on demand. That's a segment. Who wants the dynamic interactive of the seminar? Who's prepared to do self-service? Because that's a different value response. That's a different reaction, different engagement. So I've divided up the course into that, those two categories initially. Then I took the live events and said, well, who's free in the afternoon? Who's free in the evening? Day walkers, night stalkers. Who's not free at all on a Monday? Shadow hawkers. I gave my segments names and labels so we could create identity and create shared bonded identities around them. So the purpose of your segmentation, and you are going to be asked to do segmentation to tasks and activities around a few different things. One's your project, one's your platform you're using for your project. But ultimately, end of the day, what you want to be able to do is say, who's it for? What do they want? And what can I do to help? And that's what, why? Who's it for? Everyone. Well, that's going to suck because you're not going to be able to create anything specific. So you want to be able to target down to a group of people who will react in a similar way to the value offer so you can give them the best outcome you can with your offering that has value. Things that you're looking for. Uh, uses, patterns, experience. We're going to talk a couple of different segment opportunities here and a few more down in consumer behavior. But basically, one of the other things for self-segmentation is how good are you at the internet? How long have you been on the internet? Like, sure, you may have been born into it, but um, I was molded by it. I came into the internet when I was already experienced with a set of tools and techniques. And that enabled me to find a path, find a place. Uh, but don't ask me to use mobile phone apps because I'm not as good at those as I am with my desktop. And that's the other thing is I'm driven by desktop computing. Not laptops, not mobiles, not tablets. I'm all about the desktop. So usage patterns, experience, expertise. The other thing you're looking for here is familiarities. You're wanting to think, well, how much do I know about a product? How familiar am I with a product? What do I do with it? So you have all these different tools and you're going to use them. So I'm highlighting them here because welcome to, currently you are just looking over a toolbox worth of things that you're going to use. And I'm just familiarizing you with the different hammers, wrenches, chainsaws and light cannons that you'll need to break up the audience. And uh, oh, here's my big one. The relative usefulness of your online offering for the end user. This is probably the biggest segmentation split in, mark in this marketing subject. What is the relative advantage of doing this course? That's for you to determine. Uh, I think I've got some advantage over your other choices. I am an el the host of an elective marketing subject. You have other choices, and I'm hoping to retain you for the length of the semester because my choice is better than an alternative. All right, audience market fit. Uh, this is a concept that's going to be really important to you and you're going to do in practice, and that is... What is it you want to do with your project? And does it fit the audience? And are you willing to change your project to better fit your audience? Or is your project more important than that fit? This is really, really important. As well as everything else I've done in my life, I've been a musician and I've created music and I've created music that I wanted to hear. So I didn't think about an audience when I was writing it that wasn't me. Now, it's resonated with a few other people and a bunch of people have liked it, which is great. But when I wrote a... I've written a couple of books. I've written a couple of textbooks. And I went 
I had a textbook I wanted to write and the publisher said, yeah, but we want a different book. And I said, well, okay, I want to write a book. I'm not actually wedded to my conceptual framework here. I will change, you are my audience, I will change my product to fit your needs. That sometimes as a marketer you go, yeah, actually I'll, I'll, I'll switch that, I can do that. I don't mind doing that. Sometimes as a marketer you'll go, no, that's not with, that's not what our product stands for. It's not what I want to do with the product. All right, market segmentation. Let's get into a couple of the technicals. Then we're going to run it down to targeting and positioning. In all marketing, you start with a primary segment. You start with the first segment, the segment that's going to kick it off for you. You do not go, oh, I'll take all six things. You don't work like that. Pick one, kick off with that, then move into the next one. Then maybe you pick the primary market segment that's got the most overlaps, so you've got a springboard to go into the next sections. It's a difficult decision, it's a complex decision, it should give you a bit of a headache, uh, it should trigger your fear of missing out, it should be an opportunity cost, because at the end of the day you want to pick a segment that's most valuable to you because it's interesting, you can work with it, and you'll benefit from engaging with it and from what you do there can be used as the platform to move on to the next segments. I am not saying you may only ever do one segment, I'm saying you start somewhere then you move to the second step. So many people want to start on step four which they cannot jump to and they can't even get to step. If they don't go step one you can't get to step four. So balance of interestingness, uh, this is something you're going to need to deal with. You are going to tell me about who the segment for your audience is and for the project you're running, who do you want in that audience? Who do you want watching your videos, liking your uh, posts on Instagram? Who do you want? What's your fit? And do you want to spend the next 10 weeks making stuff for them? I mean, sure. There are audiences you could look at and say, yeah, I could attract them. But, oh, I don't really want them. Or you can look at audiences and go, all right, I want to take the money from them. I just don't want to become like them. Also fair. But be careful if you go down that path. Quite often you find out that actually you become them in order to take the money from them and you can't get yourself back. So other thing on segmentation is, it is a decision that creates a consequence and consequences are good and consequences are our friends. This course is going to teach you about consequences in marketing and it's going to be really good because a consequence is an outcome. It says that you've made a decision and that consequence of that decision should start changing things and making it, if you've gone in with a market segmentation and you haven't, and you've picked a segment and you haven't been able to make substantive changes to your marketing mix, go back and pick another segment. If you can't see it impacting on the decisions you make, then you haven't done the segmentation properly. Like I said, uh, I've mentioned this a couple of times, so I want to talk about a consequence to sequence. I have segmented this audience, this course, into two groups. Available Monday, not available Monday. Consequence is, I have now created two channels. Asynchronous content delivery for Wednesday, Synchronous events Monday. Decision had a consequence. Decision had a consequence. And the consequence is good. If I'd say, oh yeah, you can do it um, if you're here or not, and there was no difference, then I hadn't made a segment. That segment wasn't useful. Um, if there was no Shadowhawker sessions, then was it really available, not available as a segment? All right, targeting, 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 targeting. It is intentionality. It is doing things deliberately. It is getting your strategy on and making it work because you've gone and said, this is what my consequence is. Again, I'm going to use a quick case study here. This course, this content, I have gone and said, there will be an asynchronous class. I have created, recorded, and produced all of the asynchronous class content before I stepped into doing these videos. 
And the reason I did that is that the asynchronous team is going to have the most dependency on the video, so I need to make certain all these things link back and cross wire and connect to each other. So the targeting here, they were the priority, they were the acted upon, because the real time class can be acted upon literally in real time. I can leave changes and modifications to the minutes after the feedback is received rather than having to prepare things far in advance. So again, target consequence from a decision. So your second thing that you want to understand in the segmentation that you're going to be doing is that once you've decided this is who my audience is, I will then use that to impact the marketing mix because I will change my product. I will modify my product to suit the audience fit of the target audience who I'm going after first. So again, in the subject, the first modification was pre-record, create the content, make certain the content works for this group, This, which gave me a body of content which I've then now got available to use for the second target audience of interest to me, which is the live attendees who have a different characteristic which requires a different product. And I have a foundation upon which from my primary audience to go to my secondary audience, the live team, because the secondary audience has a different trait. They're not the lesser audience, they're not the worse audience, they are the audience that I'm engaging second. Also, the reason that they are the second audience is I can't prepare the live event in advance of it being live. So the characteristic of real-time engagement means that I, as a services marketing outcome, I have the inseparability. I cannot stockpile live events, but I can stockpile pre-recorded events so I could produce those before I could create the live events. Again, there's no uh, priority one, priority two is not about a moral judgment. It's about what's the most practical thing. Ultimately, this is going to be your question this semester. Who are you going to create that content for? And this is the ultimate question. So, again, one of your challenges as a marketer, particularly in social media, is that your content may go beyond the boundaries of your target audience. So you may find yourself creating for an audience you want and an audience you don't want gets access. But if you've done your segmentation properly, you can have no qualms whatsoever about saying, you're not my audience, I'm not interested in responding to you, block, 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 none of you are free from being the wrong segment, block. You don't have to engage everyone, you don't have to address everyone. It is customers, clients, partners as your priority. Society at large gets a run, but your target audience is your priority. You don't have to modify what you offer if it doesn't suit an audience who doesn't like you and doesn't want you and doesn't isn't your chosen market. All right, positioning. This is going to come back a couple of times. Um, this is basically a relative location. Uh, position is determined by a whole bunch of different things. It's so much easier in physical products where you literally are discussing where in the store you are and you can look at a shelf and go, what is the product above, below, to the left, to the right? And there are numbers of stories about how positioning strategy was done about the most competitive space to bid for on the shelf is not eye level, it's hand level. Because the number of times one brand owns the eye level and another brand owns the hand level and you're looking at your product you want, you put your hand out and you come back later and it's like, I didn't, that's not what I wanted. It's what I bought. In social media, in the project you're doing, positioning is a much harder beast because it's harder to see where you are, but you can be, it's like X for Y. You know, 
It's like Mr. Beast for boomers. Uh, it's like Twitch for radio. It's like Fortnite for soccer. If you can imagine, if you can do an it's X for Y statement about your product, then you know it's positioning strategy. Uh, now, a couple of things to be aware of in positioning is the third step in the process. You start with the audience, you start with addressing the audience, then you see whether in fact you are getting what, to be where the audience thinks you should be. Uh, you will find that you don't get to control positioning as much as you influence it. At the end of the day, if you think you're a luxury good and your audience doesn't, well, that's it. Tough. Time to change strategy. Uh, but also, the times in which a brand that thought it was just a nice little generic operative, nothing special, nothing important, suddenly got picked up by hipsters and it was the most high demand thing, Dunlop Volleys. It was a great moment. Great moment in $5 white tennis shoes being the go-to hipster choice and Target sold out of them in a heartbeat and people were fighting in Kmart to get their last pair of Dunlop Volleys. Of course, fashions change, but you know, it was wonderful. It was one of the best moments as a marketer to watch a brand that just didn't expect what was about to happen next get absolutely swamped. Still don't know, I actually, I think I do know why is there was a whole bunch of lifestyle um, hipsters who were going out and doing you know, going to beaches and running along sand and basically ruining $200 pairs of shoes each time they stepped out of their uh, photo studio. And then they found that there was this five buck pair that actually could get the job done and survive. And they were like, oh, I'll, I'll use those. And then people worked out what brand they were and he was on. Of which brings us nicely to one of the biggest chunkiest, meatiest parts of this course, and that's value. End of the run, This, if you take nothing else out of e-marketing and the marketing theory stakes, being able to work with and on value and the co-creation of value is the mission critical thing. Your task this semester is to create a project that will deliver value to an audience and you're going to need to go from value as something that you write down on an exam booklet to somewhere to value as something that you make happen. So let's talk about a couple of other things. The theory underpinning this is the idea of anything that satisfies a need or want from the customer's perspective. The customer determines the value you create the offering and cannot emphasize that hard enough. <coughs> it's subjective. It's the consumer's perspective. And what this means sometimes is that you might look at something and go, there is no value to this. But the customer's completely getting into it, the customer's super excited, then provide it to them. Give it to them. Let them have it. Um, also, there are certain internet rules that will not be invoked here, but functionally, the internet is a very big market of things, and out there, there's a value offering for everything and everyone. And some of those value offerings are terrifying to me because they are, I am not the target market. And some of the terrifying offerings that I look at and go, I like that target, I like that, I am so that target market, are equally terrifying to others. So, value is subjective. You create the offering, the customer creates the value. Now we have this model, the buyer's perception of value. It is from uh, Kotler, it's an old Kotler model. Uh, it comes out in 97, but hasn't been superseded because it's working. There's a number of things. Actually, 97 was a good year. There's a couple of other theories that, from that year that are still working 25 years on. But what's critical here is Understanding that functionally value is a balance of what the customer gets out versus what the customer has to outlay. 
Now we talk about total customer cost here, but we could also equally call that price. And you'll see that this is where we have uh, the origin story of our pricing structure. You will see when we get to the pricing lectures of there's money, then there's time, energy, and psychic cost. We deal with the non-financial price as a major component of this course, and we'll get into that in depth when, in future weeks. So here's your chance now to get a bit of a heads up that when we're thinking about the value, you're thinking about what it does for you, but we're also thinking about that trade-off is what do you have to outlay to get to it, which hooks us back to SIVA. The solution is determined also by can you access the solution, in which case that's part of the customer cost. The access is part of the customer cost. The value of the product is what do you get from it? But the access is what does it take to get the solution? All right, co-creation of value. Uh, Vargo and Luce, 2004 onwards. Uh, the late Robert Lush was also responsible for a number of other theoretical frameworks around this time. I, it's taken me a long time to get to the point I can comfortably say that I don't deeply dislike service dominant logic anymore, but it's still not the world's best and still not the world's most universal theory. Uh, functionally for us, this course, co-creation. The customer must be actively involved. To make this course work, to make this subject work, there's no passive mode. There's no sit back and let it happen. You've got to participate, contribute, engage, do. It is an applied course because it's an active course because it requires stuff to happen. Which means that we are driven by service dominant logic. Uh, everything in here is a service. Everything is a co-created service and a huge amount of it is self-service. I put these, this video is a self-service event. I'm putting a bunch of ideas together out there for you. You then are tasked with making use of it. Good luck, my friends, good luck. But this is probably the, the underpinning framework, co-creation, of which co-production from services also works. So let's talk about different types of value. And uh, not values as in moral codes, value as in co-creation. So the first one I want to mention is the concept of value in use. And now these frameworks uh, come from a number of sources in the service dominant research, Vargo and Lush, uh, across the 10 years following 2004, uh, and Varian Ballantyne, 2008 that I also have one of my own frameworks in here because I finally got the hang of, well, I finally got to like value in the way they were structuring it. And it turns out one of the things that I'd been talking about might actually have been my, that I was attributing to Vary and Valentine was a bit of my own work. It happens. The worth of an object is in what you can do with it. And this is value in use. Uh, value and use is really important on idea-based products and service-based products. There is no use to a theory, there's no use to an idea, until you use it. A memory is only as good as the ability to recall it. In contrast, I would argue that for certain objects, physical objects, some of the times the value isn't in the use, it's in other aspects. There isn't a use scenario. Uh, I question some of the extensions of these frameworks. But functionally, for what we want to do with this subject this semester, if you set up a social media account and don't do anything with it, then there's no value it's providing to you. So that's value and use is you've got to put the effort in and you've then got to co-create, you've then got to be present at the point of consumption in order for the consumption to be occurring and for it to be of use to you. So this raises a couple of problems.
problems that you need to resolve, and that is, if it's in use, this lights up SIVA. Can the customer get the value out of the offer? Is the value in use? The value in use then becomes an accessibility question. Can you access the value? It becomes a skills question. Do you need to have certain skills to get certain returns? For example, if the value and use on a camera is in taking the photography, there is a certain set of basic skills that you need in the use of a digital camera. One set is with the camera, framing, focusing, shot selection, and one set is with the computer. Now, if you focus all your attention on value of the object and think that the transaction ends when the artifact leaves the store, then you would miss the value. What does the customer need to get the value out? They need to be able to get the photos off the camera to go to somewhere else. The camera is not the repository of the photos. The camera is the mechanism to access the photos. So its value and use cascades into a series of other behaviors and values. So expertise, skills, experience, and secondary support was necessary to access the value. And for you, you're going to need to think about that, and then you're going to need to work it out for yourself. What does it take to get value out of the course? What will it take to get value out of the project? And what will the customer, what, if anything, does the customer need in order to get value from the product you're offering? And I'm going to highlight this to say you want to look at this because you can up the challenge level and make it harder to get the value out of a product. And that becomes a feature that allows you to do price positioning as this is access expensive, therefore it's luxury good. Or it's an, ex it's an exclusive class of people who can get the value from this project or from this product. And that's how we've got the third version of Dark Souls. Equipment, I mentioned this briefly with the camera. Do you need equipment to activate and maximize the value? Uh, there are some questions around subjective and objective um, are here of, do you, for value and use, do you need certain artifacts? Is it better to be watching uh, an Amazon TV, a, watching Amazon show on Amazon Prime on the Amazon TV with the Amazon um, in-room spy listening to you? Is it better? Uh, can you convince people it's better? So there's some challenges around that. Now this is the one that uh, gets me on a regular basis for value and use. Is the value one shot. Value and use of the Pepsi Max is keeping me doing this lecture. Is it reusable? No, that wants the caffeine consumed gone. Is it storable? Well, value and use on the camera, it's storable, it's divisible, it's reusable. There's a whole bunch of, yep, yep, that can be done. Uh, and then there's some things on the value and use challenge that I'm bringing up and it's going to come into one of the factors I've brought to the show is where is the consumption protocol? Where does consumption happen? And what is the purpose of consumption? So are you creating content through your, and this is your consideration, for your project, are you going to create something that is consumed on? For example, you are... And go to use Instagram, you post photos, people go, oh, I like that photo, leave a comment, press the like button. Or are you going to use Instagram as a platform to be a social influencer who's a personal trainer, and you're like, hey guys, this week I want you to do 10 jumping jacks. Well, they can't do that just by pressing like. They've got to separate themselves out from the phone, do the jumping jacks, and come back and say, yeah, leave a comment below when you've done it. So... That's consumed, the value proposition of your personal training is consumed separately from the point of its delivery. So there's a whole bunch of stuff to play with, and you should want to play with it. 
So the second le level, second tier of value is what a product is worth in terms of its resale and its ability to on sale. Uh, I look at this, uh, ironically, there's nothing with an easy reach in my here. This is where you are either in business to business transactions or you are a collector, a wholesale resale. Uh, the potential resale of an object, uh, the purchase of a car that you then do up, which you then on sell, uh, all these things. Basically, you are looking at what is the value exists between what you, the point of offer and transaction. So value in exchange is what something's worth to be on sold or resold. Value and ownership, on the other hand, is about mere possession, sheer possession. Now, some of this is value and ownership has an antithesis point of value and use. If the purpose of the object is to be consumed, then it is a value and use. But if the purpose of the object is to be consumed and you don't consume it, but you instead stockpile it or collect it or have it so that it cannot be consumed by another, that's value and ownership. It can be little things like I have a miniature figure that I own because I like it. Uh, I call that value and ownership. I don't have a use for it. I don't do things with it. I merely know that possessing it brings me happiness. That's not use, in my view. Uh, that is non-behavioural. That is, it's attitudinal, so value and ownership is more to the attitudinal, more to the emotional, uh, even to the cognitive. Uh, I feel that value in use requires behavioural. Value and ownership does not require behavioural. But, at the end of the day, value and ownership is also the contrapoint. You have use, Value only exists if you're doing something with it. Therefore, when it's not in use, it's not in value. Which also means that subjectively, this camera is currently useless as a camera, but useful as an example. Whereas merely knowing I've got it, so if I ever need to take a photo, that brings me certainty. <coughs> also, value and ownership is how you rationalise having a stockpile of stuff in the cupboard. Value and use is how you rationalise buying the next new thing that you definitely need. Definitely need that new camera. Alright, marketing and internet theory. Uh, I want to quickly flag this one, highlight this one to you. It comes back a couple of points along the way. There is a paper from 96, Hoffman and Novak, uh, marketing in hypermedia computer mediated environments. It is one of the most influential papers, one of the most cited papers of all time. Hoffman and Novak are two of the most terrifyingly intelligent people I have ever come across. And Hoffman, Donna Hoffman on her own, and Thomas Novak on his own, are incredibly smart people. And Hoffman and Novak as a combined unit are also amazing to watch. Uh, they are just incredibly smarter than most average humans. It's incredible. They came up with a framework that brings in concepts of flow state, brings in concepts of hypermediate communication. But it also brings in this idea of what does it take to be in the internet space? And it is the question of that multi-point of can we communicate to an audience? Can an audience communicate back to us? And hypermedia communication is the principle of this subject. I can communicate to you, and you can communicate to me. It is more readily apparent when we're in real time uh, in a seminar, but equally, this is a broadcast through a medium to an audience who then has a series of channels that they can respond back to me. You can go back to me through Padlet, through Wattle Forum, directly over email or indirectly out through social media. You can contact me. It's not just one way broadcast. From this, one more theoretical framework that's important. Uh, this semester you are going to be engaging with metrics. You are going to set yourself some goals and then you're going to measure the outcome of those goals. So you're going to use metrics. I want to just 
get you to get comfortable with the idea right from the outset, all of marketing is an experiment. Everything's experimental. For every marketing action, there is a marketing reaction, there is a marketing consequence, and for every consequence, there is a new action. Metrics are your way of measuring your consequence. So what you want to be able to do with a metric is look and say, what is my action? How do I know my action has transpired? How do I then see if I am on the way to my goal? How do I track my goal? How do I engage? So we're going to use metrics and we're going to train you up in setting a goal that can be measured, that can then be useful for attaining an outcome and the metrics that you sh would value, would find use from. Because the other thing about metrics is that metrics are a value in use proposition. Merely having a score saying, oh, I've got 9 out of 10, doesn't mean anything. Having a score that says, oh, 6 from 5, meaningless. Unless you're using your metrics and your metrics drive your next set of decisions and they inform what you can look back and say, this worked, this didn't, then metrics are not a value and ownership proposition. They are value in use. So you need them to lean forward. You need them to measure what gets done and measure what's doable. You can use them for inputs. So I have a metric and that metric is, I want to create 26 pieces of content for this course. Uh, that is, there are four items that I want to create for assessment tasks, 22 points remaining. I have 11, I have 12 content blocks that I want to do. Uh, I have 11 classes. I have week nine to go to public holiday. So I can measure all these things up. In fact, I should probably have 30 pieces of course content I should create. What gets measured? And I'll know whether I'm on track when I can say, oh, I'm at this point in the construction. So that was a big, heavy lifting section. If you want feedback, uh, I want to provide feedback or ask questions, there is the Padlet. And it has a section for things you'd like further explained. There is the Wattle forum, where there will be questions for you to answer and conversations for you to have with friends. And then there's going direct to me. If I'm on a social media platform, I'm on it under my full name. Uh, otherwise, you've got the email address to contact me on. And with that, dear friends, that's the session. Thanks for sticking around. Ooh.